In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are getting back to our um, letters and notes from Seraphims and Seraphimas because there are so many in response to our previous videos. And this, this note in particular, introduces somehow both the topic of today's video but also justifies why I, I felt the need to record the previous two. Maybe it's a question of acceptance. God only created perfection and we are God's creation. The sin consists in not being able to accept ourselves exactly as we are. The sin is the presumption that we are not as we should be. We are human. We are men and women and we can only reflect our nature. There is nothing wrong in this. God loves us unconditionally, exactly as we are. We should learn to love ourselves too. I'm not going to put this away because literally there isn't one line of this that doesn't go against the teaching of Christ. And I'm... I can identify with this. Sometime in my early teens, mid-teens, I did, I did have this um, belief that I am perfect. I am perfect exactly as I am, and I should continue exactly as I am, and I should reject any sort of attempt from any source around me to change me, or to correct me, or to make me better. Reject the teachings of my parents, reject the teachings of my uh, professors in school, and definitely reject the teachings of Christ, um, or God in general, because I was the center of the universe, because I was perfect as I was, and I had no need to become any better since I was perfect. The problem is that that way of thinking got me... First, it got me into a lot of sin, because... You know, if I'm perfect, and if God loves me exactly as I am, if God's unconditional love can erase everything and cover everything, then I can do whatever I want. I can live my life, as people say. So that was the first stage. Um, but that was followed very quickly and very abruptly by a close to perfection, <laughs> to use your words, dear Seraphim, a close to perfection depression and uh, despondency, and I got very, very close to, to ending my life, to suicide. It ended up being my way back to Christ, because indeed God has no one to lose. And when I pushed myself down this path to the brink of self-destruction, Christ stepped in and saved me. That's where you see God's unconditional love. But apart from that experience in my teens, the more I grow into my spiritual life, the more I become familiar with the spiritual lives of our saints, the more I understand the gospel and the teachings that some of them precede the gospel, and others, up to our time, apply the Gospels to us. The more I understand Christianity, the more I realize how every single sentence in this message, which is written out of honesty, and I believe it's written out of a desire to help, um, is wrong. And it is nothing but the product of an abuse of Christ's teachings, not an abuse by you personally. Uh, very few of us are in a position to even be the abusers of Christ's words. Most of us, 99.9%, .9%, we are just being fed these abusive misinterpretations, these deformations of Christ's teachings. They've been developed way before we were even alive. 
everywhere around us, and then we've been spoon-fed these, these dreadful heresies, because that's what they are, until we end up believing them, and we end up thinking that we are Christians, when in fact we've taken the wisdom that we think makes us Christians from the world. We've taken something that uses Christ's words as Christ's teachings, but actually those words were rearranged, reinterpreted, and given a completely different meaning by the world around us. And without knowing it, simply by being in that context, we are shaped by all of this, and we end up believing them. It is an abuse to think that we are perfect as we are in this world. It is an abuse because we are perfect in a way, but not in this world. We have the potential to be perfect. God did create perfection, taking your first line. But the perfection that is in us is a potential we have to actualize, we have to make real by the choices that we make in our life. God created us free beings, given this extraordinary gift of free will, which can either make us or break us. It can be a curse if we misuse our free will, because it is the thing that can take us down. But without this gift, of the free will. We can never become God-like. It's in the way in which we exercise our free will that we go either one direction or the other. God only created perfection and we are God's creation. Yes, potentially we are perfect. It's up to us to receive God's grace, to manifest that grace in the way in which we act into the world, to transform ourselves so that we can reach the perfection to which we are called. This perfection is not the perfection of a sinful human being. As you say, uh, we are humans, we are men and women, we can only reflect our nature. There's nothing wrong in that. That's not the perfection to which you are called. You are called to be perfect as the Father is perfect. Can you see why I said this is a blasphemy? There is in this world, I'll put this aside for a second, there is in this world this movement. You've got, you've got God over here with His perfection and we are down here with our perfection. And there can only be two movements. Either we move upwards and we become God-like, and that is salvation. That is indeed perfection, to become God-like in eternity. Or we give in to our sin, we collapse under our sin. We listen to the billions of voices around us that whisper us that we should change nothing. And then we end up either rejecting a God that tells us to change, as he does every page of the Gospel, or we end up redefining God, and this is where it becomes a heresy. Because you can redefine God, you can take his words and give them new meanings, meanings that he did not intend those words to have, so that instead of us moving upwards, reflecting God onto ourselves, we bring God downwards and we reshape him as if he's made of clay onto our image. Instead of us letting go of our sinfulness and moving towards God-like perfection, as Christ calls us, be perfect as God in heaven is perfect, we force this fake mask upon God, so he reflects our image, so he abandons his perfection and reflects our sinfulness as if this sinfulness, this state of our being, is God's own perfection. That is a dreadful way 
um, in which the world has corrupted our mind and corrupted our understanding of our own vocation. And if we don't understand our high calling, if we don't hold on to our high calling, everything is lost because every sense of direction is lost. If you don't know where you're heading, you'll never reach anywhere because you're just going to go left and right, up and down, everywhere around, following these billions of voices that speak in our ears. Yes, we are humans, we are men and women, we can only reflect our nature. There is nothing wrong in this. This, if this sentence had been written by someone who's already in the kingdom, this would be perfect. But this sentence, unfortunately, has been written by another Seraphim or Seraphima who is a sinner like myself. And this is why this is a corruption of the truth. This is exactly, this belief is exactly what the devil did to Adam and Eve in Eden. He gave them the truth before its time. He spoke of their potential as if they already owned it. He told them, you will, you will become like God, God-like, if you eat out of that apple, if you eat out of that tree. He told them the truth. It is our calling to become God-like, but not in that way and not then. There's a process of growing in obedience to God's word, and that process transforms us, changes us. The same thing happens here. We can only reflect our nature. Yes, my dear Seraphim, you can only reflect your nature and I can only reflect my nature. It's the same nature. We all have, we all share human nature. But the reality is that apart from God himself in the person of Christ, and apart from the saints that lived after that, who received an experience of their grace, of their nature, as a grace from God, apart from this very small um, club of human beings, no one else has experienced human nature in its fullness, in its perfect, absolute potential. The fullness of our nature, talking about potential and what our high calling is, the fullness of our nature is to be able to accept the fullness of divinity in it. This is, this is what we see in Christ's pers person, fully God, fully human, perfectly living out the potential of both natures. Apart from Christ, who lives that through his incarnation, and apart from the, from the experience of saints who've lived that for brief seconds, just manifestations of their full nature, none of us experience who we truly are until we are in the kingdom. And even the saints, the way they speak about these experiences, they speak as if they are possessed they are possessed by their own humanity. When they have an experience of their true humanity, they talk as men and women who are possessed by it and they are afraid of it. Saint Siluan from the Holy Mountain, he says that if those experiences had been longer by one second, he fears he may not have survived them. He fears Saints fear that they cannot survive their own humanity once they are given an experience of its full potential, that God-like potential. And you, my dear Seraphim, think that your human nature is to just do whatever the devil puts in your mind, whatever the world around you promotes as their motos and their propaganda. Yes! Love whom God created you to be, but don't love whom the devil forces us or slowly tricks us into becoming. It's a matter of who do you choose to be. It's a matter of who and how you define yourself to be. Do you allow your sin to define yourself? Because if you allow your sin to define yourself, then yes, 
This is who you've decided in your own free will to be. But don't call that God's creation. That's your creation under the influence of the devil and of the world around us, which is all listening to the voice of the devil. You are not created to be your sin. You are created to be God-like, to be able to receive in yourself God's own life. Everything that God is in virtue of his nature, we can be as well by grace, receiving it by grace. Our nature, our real nature, is able to receive everything that God is as gift, as grace. Change, transformation, is what Christ is all about. His first words in the world as, as a preacher, when he started his work for our salvation, his first word was repent, taking it from St. John the Baptist. Repent. It, repentance means change, transformation. Would you tell the demoniacs in the gospel whom Christ released of those demons, would you tell them, oh, love yourselves just as you are? Just accept yourself because this is who you are. These fallen creatures with all these demons just making a mockery of God's image in you. This is who you are. Embrace yourself. Would you do that to those demon-possessed people whom Christ physically changed? and spiritually gave birth to anew? Would you tell St. Mary Magdalene that she should embrace her life and herself as she was before Christ freed her from those seven, seven demons? Would you tell, I don't know, Peter, the Holy Apostle, to embrace himself in his denial of Christ? Shouldn't he change? Shouldn't he respond to Christ's questions? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times mirroring the three denials so he gets to change and get himself up from his fall. Would you tell that poor woman who was caught committing a sin, an adultery, would you tell her, embrace yourself as you are, love yourself as you are, when Christ himself tells her, you are free of your sin, make sure you don't sin anymore. When Christ tells us, make sure you don't sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you, would you tell those people, don't listen to Christ, you are perfect as you are. Well, if you would, forgive me. Why do you think that you are following Christ? When Christ speaks of us in our state, in our sinful state, as dogs returning to their own vomit because we make the same sin again and again, or pigs, swine, wallowing in, in, in their own filth, would you tell these people, stay as you are? And do you think, do you truly think in the, in the heart of your heart, do you truly think that this is what Christ came to tell us? Because it isn't, my dear, dear Seraphim. And there are only two ways in which this belief, which is nothing but the belief of the world being spoon-fed to us, there are only two ways in which this can end. With you, either two bad ways and a good way. Either the bad ways are you either end up rejecting Christ because you so fall in love with your own ideas and, and, and values that you end up rejecting Christ's, or you end up holding on to these till the end of your life and you are going to hear, may no one ever hear those words. You call me Lord, Lord, but I've never met you. I don't know who you are. The good way, the good way this can end is with you going through a crisis. A crisis is a wonderful thing for us to go through. It's a moment of change. It's a moment when we realize that we need to either limit ourselves and we need to reject any higher calling or we realize we need to grow. And growth 
once again, my seraphim, growth implies change. Nothing that grows stays the same. To be perfect as you are in your sin is to allow your sin to define you and to say that there is no growth possible in you or indeed even necessary in you. Be blessed. Be safe until next time. Just try to read the gospel. Try to read the gospel with no voices around you. Allow the gospel to, to seem paradoxical. Allow the gospel to be annoying and unpleasant and allow it to be God's word, a sword in your life. Because it is meant to be a sword. It is meant to, to burn things in us and to plant new seeds in us. Be blessed, be loved and love as much as you can, everyone around you. Amen. Amen. Amen.